in my own journey, after asking my most difficult questions and, and putting Jesus and the Bible under my most difficult scrutiny, still remains the most beautiful picture of hope and healing that a broken person can find. Welcome to Reclamation, a Be Emboldened initiative. I am Naomi. I'm the founder and executive director here at BE, and we exist for those who have been impacted by spiritual abuse. And we do this, we help by providing support for the prevention of victimization and re-victimization. We create a safe place to ask the hard questions and to begin healing and rebuilding. Today, I feel so honored to be welcoming T.C. Cannon back onto Reclamation for what is a very, very special episode. It has been five years since T.C. herself experienced spiritual abuse, and I am so thankful for how out she has been about her experience and what her journey has looked like. But today, we get to do a five-year later reflection. It has been five years since, and she's going to share with us what's new now, what's different now, what's been hard, what's still hard, what has improved and all those things. So to give you a little introduction though, in case you're unfamiliar with TC, this is your first time hearing from her. She is a former public and private school teacher with a master's degree in pastoral care and counseling and a pending certificate in Christian apologetic. She is also an author and speaker with a special interest in helping others find true hope and healing. She has been a voice in the realm of spiritual abuse since her personal experience of harm again five years ago. And with that, we're going to jump right into the first question and ask TC, would you mind again, for anyone who may be unfamiliar and is hearing from you for the first time, would you provide an overview of what happened five years ago? Sure. And I guess I would, I'll preface it by saying, obviously, I've got a video. We've actually had a conversation earlier where I went into a quite a bit more detail. And so I don't know if maybe we can link to that or um, something at the end, just to, you know, for anyone who's interested in hearing more detail on it. But, you know, as I look back on what we went through, I would say that our situation, I actually, I did grow up in a cult, but that is not the situation I'm referring to. I'm referring to my experience in what would be described as your more commonly occurring church hurt, Um, abuse that happened from toxic leadership in a church you might see on any street corner. So this isn't your highly controlled cult uh, experience uh, that, um, for example, you have survived and walked through. But it was a church I had attended for 23 years. I had served in almost every capacity from children's ministry on up to women's ministry, teaching in high school and youth. And I was just deeply invested. Our whole family was invested. My, my husband was a children's pastor there at the time and an elder. And so this was a community that we had given our heart and soul to for many years. And um, of I can treasure hunt that. I have so many blessings from those years. But what ended up occurring was ultimately the leader grew in in his ability and capacity to make just unilateral decisions without any accountability. And over the years, uh, you know, I can see it better looking back, which I I know we'll discuss. But it, it his behavior just became more and more and more authoritarian where his position as the CEO basically of this of the church could not be questioned, could not be um, held, he couldn't be held accountable. And when people offended him in a way that he received as a deep injury to his reputation or his authority, they would just be um, ushered away in, in various ways. And that's what happened to myself and my husband. We in an attempt to lovingly approach him with some first, it started as just trying to help him see blind spots, which he had always invited people to do from the pulpit. 
Um, it started there, and then it became a journey of trying to walk through Matthew 18 with him, which was sharing my brokenness, my pain, uh, and expecting that to turn out well, expecting that to be something that would be healing and redemptive and actually grow our relationship. Uh, well, it didn't work out so that way, and it ended up becoming an ultimatum for my husband and me that we needed to trust him completely, never speak of our issues again, or find another church. And that is such a simplification of our journey. But what it ended up resulting in was us having really no choice biblically. Uh, we had no other higher um, leadership to appeal to. We had nowhere to go. My husband knew this by experience through his journey as an elder there. And we ended up having to follow Jesus out of this place in our life. But we had realized we can't stay here and lend credibility to this uh, we can't adhere to his demands. And so we walked away um, with no choice, leaving really our entire world, our, our not only salary and benefits and things like that, but also our relationships, our community, our investment, uh, our purpose, uh, our topic of discussion. It was crazy how much was actually taken uh, from us in a way of presenting us with that ultimatum that we just really had no choice. We couldn't, we couldn't abide by it. it. It wasn't biblical. And that is the super fast summary of what we walked through. But 23 years of investment somewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a whole life is built yeah. in those 23 years. And so I appreciate you also mentioning some of those specific losses that you took. I know people are going to resonate with that. Because some people, yeah, it's the financial, it's the benefits because people are on staff and that's very real, of course. Mm -hmm. And that can be a, a reason why people hang on for longer than, than maybe they ought to because they end up getting more hurt in other ways, but also the total loss of community. And may, may I ask briefly too, before we move forward in the conversation, how did it impact your faith? At the time, it, I mean, it may seem you know, crazy, but it didn't really impact my faith. Uh, and I know we'll get into that a little bit more as we probably, as we continue this conversation, it didn't impact my faith in Jesus, but it impacted my understanding and my, my faith in what I thought was my reality. So, the, you know, not my faith in him, but my faith and understanding in the church and in the people that were around me and even in my own ability to make decisions, those types of things were definitely affected. And because I thought I was in a certain world and within a matter of a sh just a very short period of time, it was as if I was able to see um, the great and powerful Oz was no was not who I always thought he was, yeah. and this and right. the land of Oz is not what I believed it was all these years, and that was massively destabilizing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's so disorienting, and orientation is what we like. We like to feel oriented. It's one of those like core needs we have as humans is to feel oriented, and this is incredibly disorienting. I'm yeah. wondering what your perspective was of your experience at that time when it was happening versus your perspective now. And I'm going to break that down a little bit because I know that's kind of a big question. But basically, how has your perspective changed? And then I want to talk about how has it stayed the same and then kind of what's worse or what's what's maybe better. And so to begin, how has your perspective changed of what's happened from five years ago until today? Yeah, well, I think the biggest perspective is, like I kind of just alluded to, is that at the time, I truly believed I was in a very biblical community. I My perspective was that I was living a life, um, being held accountable by, adhering to teachings from a pastor who was genuinely biblically qualified and who was absolutely 100% surrendered to the Lord. And those that were elders or leaders in the church, I my perspective was at the time that no one's perfect. I mean, I, I never thought everyone was perfect, 
but that we were truly all believing what the Bible teaches and we were seeking to be biblical Christians and we were all going to give each other the same amount of grace and mercy and the things that we follow Jesus for and believe we need for ourselves. I never perceived myself to be perfect either. I, What I perceived about myself was that I was genuinely the biggest problem because anything that went wrong, I would go before the Lord and, you know, fling wide my heart and go, what else is there? I'm, what can I repent for? What's wrong with me? Why, why can't I be good enough? Or why can't I, um, be spiritually mature enough? Or I, it always seemed like the perspective was that the, the, um, the things that I perceived were wrong red flags or that I thought were culturally funky, so to speak, with that big, that's a professional term, funky, Um, (laughs) whatever I felt wasn't quite right. You know, I would sense those things, but usually I would perceive that that was something wrong with me. Uh, My perspective, my attitude, I was growing bitter or or whatever. And so all of this perspective for me uh, was just dashed when I went through the steps of the procedures and uh, uh, upheld the teachings that I had been taught for so many years about loving one another and holding each other accountable and Matthew 18 and all that. And when that all failed and when I saw with my own eyes um, behind the curtain, the perspective massively changed, not instantly because it was so confusing and we walked through many things that now I understand are gaslighting where we were systematically put in positions to begin to question our own version of what had happened, conversations that had occurred, even motives. We were, we were, you know, put in those positions where that we were smacked around and then given big hugs and kisses, you know, so to speak. And that left us massively confused. And so now my perspective of looking back on that is not that I was perfect and I never did anything wrong and I was so whole and it was not anything to do with my heart or my own journey, but that there was a lot that was unbiblical going on around me. And it started from the top and it trickled down through the entire culture, through the DNA of the culture. And I can see it looking back. I can, I can understand the gaslighting. I can see Um, behavioral disorders in, in the leadership and the system that was created to really to protect a role and to protect a system rather than to protect the body of Christ in that local church. Uh, And, you know, that perspective continues to change as I continue to learn and grow. But um, I've also can still been able to see where God can, where I need healing, where I can be grown things I still need to repent for and all of that. I guess it's always important for me to say that I never see myself as this perfect Christian that walked through those whole 23 years perfect without anything to learn or grow from. But I think the the balance was so, so desperately skewed in the guilt and shame that I carried that was not, a, that was not justified and that was not actually biblical. So I'm beginning to get set free from, from those things, which is wonderful. It happens way too often that people who have a heart posture as you have had of, no, I want to know what my part is. I want to own what's mine and I want to repent for that. I want to seek reconciliation where someone who has uh, an ugly approach, honestly, is going to say, oh no, I can capitalize on that. I can tell them that all of this is their fault when it's not, I can use this against them. And then they don't accept accountability for anything. And it's it's painful to watch. I actually had this, um, I'm going to give a little story about Blaze really quick. So for anyone who doesn't know, my five-year-old, he made a couple poor decisions at school a couple weeks ago in, in his classroom. And so we sat down and we wrote a card to his teacher ask, saying that he was sorry for these couple of behaviors and saying, would you please forgive me? Well, there was another student involved and he wanted to write a letter to the student, a card to the student as well. Well, the student, he had not done anything to the student. The student had actually done something to him. And that was where he then acted out in a way that he still should not have. But I'm like, well, we, you were upset and we can still apologize. Even though you were upset and this other student was wrong, you still have to own your behavior. So we're still going to apologize to the teacher. He really wanted to write this other student a card. And I'm like, well, what do you have to apologize for? And he's like, I don't know. 
I'm like, well, baby, we can't apologize to someone who did something wrong to us just to make it better, just mm. to make it go away, just because we want that piece of reconciliation, because then it's not real. You know, it's yeah. not genuine. And so, and it's so uncomfortable and it's painful and it's so disappointing, but we don't always have the power and control to make it right. Sometimes wow. it just has to sit because it's on them. Yeah. And they I have mean, to choose what they're going to do. What a blessing for him to learn that from you at such a young age, because that was a tendency of mine for many, many years is just, I would try my hardest to find any little thing I could actually repent for, which isn't always wrong. But I, I, as you mentioned that it was like, yeah, I mean, it was a life cycle. It was a cycle of me just trying to, um, repent for anything just to have that peace and that reconciliation and to not be viewed as a uh, dissident, you know, in the, in the body or, or whatever, trying to bring division. And sometimes that was coming from a place of people pleasing and just being uncomfortable with letting someone else sit in their sin or in, in what they did wrong. And that, wow, the way you just taught him that was, was wonderful. Well, we'll see if it sticks. Yeah, but it stinks. <laughs> it stinks to have to sit in that because it we does. we want the relationships, we want the restoration, we care about these people. Yes, you cared about the people who are doing this to you, and so it's a loss and it's painful. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I don't say it lightly, and I don't say it like it's easy. Yeah, I'm wondering: is there anything in your perspective that you would say has stayed the same? Anything that's been consistent? I think the places where I would, at this point, just thinking through it, would say that the consistency has remained is just what I believe about Jesus and the gospel. The reason why I decided to follow Jesus in the first place has remained consistent. And I'm very thankful for that. My experience with um, His unconditional love forgiveness in my life was prior to going to any church. I, this, it happened actually just between me and God and, and Jesus. And I'm just so thankful for that because I was in before I ever went to any church or had an actual pastor. And those reasons haven't changed. I, I still need a savior. I still want a lover of my soul. I still need a healer. In fact, I need a healer more now than ever. And so those things have remained consistent Um, my understanding of how Christians should be able to repent and love and reconcile has remained consistent. What my expectation was back then is still my expectation. My expectation was that I could go in and share transparently, be courageously real and say, I'm broken. And this hurt me when you did this. And I expected that there could be a moment of mutual repentance and we could embrace and walk out of there like snotty, crying closer than ever. I still expect that. I still believe that's possible in the body of Christ. I still long for that beautiful, like you just said, that beautiful moment of where two imperfect people can circle around the cross and understand that we have this foundation from which we can admit our wrongs. Our identity is is not at all diminished by our failures. It's, it's how we walk through them. And I just still expect that. I still, I, that's, just, that's consistent for me. And, um, but there have been a lot of things that aren't as far as my relationship with church and my devotional practices and my, my, um, even my worship practices, there's some definite things that are not consistent, things that are still in progress in my life. Uh, after walking out of that, what I expect church to be, what I would ever um, give, what parts of me, my heart, will I give? uh, How cautious will I be? Things like that. But some of those big expectations are still consistent. I still believe that hope is found in in the biblical meta-narrative and the answers Jesus gives. Some of the processing that I've done over the past however many years has been, it's changed my understanding of what was really bad versus what maybe wasn't as bad, if that makes sense. So as I've learned more, as I've become more educated 
as I've just grown and, you know, a decade older or however, you know, five years older and you've learned and you've studied and you've talked with other people and you've heard other experiences and you have the time to reflect for yourself and that time with the Lord. Sometimes things, again, when we look back, it's like, wow, okay, maybe this aspect is is better than I believed at that time. And sometimes things can be worse as we have language for it. So that's kind of the last question I want to ask you about the perspective piece before we start getting into some of the specifics. Anything generally that stands out to you as, wow, no, I look back and this is better than I perceived at the time, or no, this is worse than I perceived at the time? Um, meaning from that particular group or my past experience or in general? From your experience, experience of the spiritual abuse with the pastor and with the church. Is there okay. anything where what, you're oh, of back the experience? And, mm-hmm. um, I don't think I would say anything was better about that than I thought it was. <laughs> it's not, there wasn't anything. Well, I guess only this. I, I guess I could say this. In some ways, I, well, we definitely thank God. We thank God that we ex- we walked through what we walked through because it, it was a it was definitely a harsh introduction to a reality we didn't know it was not fun to have the curtain ripped back so abruptly and definitively and in such a painful costly way but we are thankful for that experience because we were we got out of it we got out of a toxic system and we were able to walk out and now you know over the years the way god's redeemed certain things we're definitely thankful. It it seems better now looking back at it because of what we've experienced of redemption, what we've learned, uh, the other people that we've been able to come alongside and some of the different pieces that have been added to our life. There was a lot that was stolen, a lot of cost, but there's been a lot that's been added. So I would say looking back, I can see it in a different light, a better light because of what we, the freedom we now have and the growth we've experienced, but it does, it wasn't I don't look back and think that it was better than I thought it was then. It was definitely as ugly and painful as it was, but um, God's used it for good in our life. Yeah, absolutely. That's something about the redemption part, right? It's like, well, no, I'd rather never do it again, please. Right. But I can't say to totally give it back either because Mm -hmm. of what he's doing with it. Yeah, there's the beauty in it. And the hope for anyone who's not at that point yet, that prayerfully that will be coming. Prayerfully that's on the horizon. Now, I know that you navigated this journey as a family. You're married. You have three kiddos. I don't believe you wouldn't have had grandchildren at the time yet. Nope. But you had three kids and they were on the older side as well. So they remembered this. So would you mind sharing a bit about how you navigated it? Sure. So yes, my, our daughter was already, um, out of the home. She was in, um, this is five years ago. So she was 23 college, you know, out of the home and she was not attending the church we were at at the time. So she had kind of moved on from her own experiences and she was out. And then our boys were still in high school and they attended a school that was, um, a partner to our church. So it was actually the building of our church was where, my my two boys were attending high school. So it was deeply complicated with, um, you know, my, I had a senior graduating and my younger son was a junior and had been at this same school all this time. So we were faced with this decision and that's kind of a longer story. They ended up staying at the school because they really were led by different um, leaders at the time. And they were allowed to stay, which seemed better for them. However, we chose, my husband and I very prayerfully and intentionally chose to walk this journey with our children very transparently. It would not have made any sense to them if we hadn't, because they had all been born there and raised there and they're baptized there. And, um, you know, this was their volunteer community. This is where they went to summer camp. These are their friends. And for us to just pull out and just say something like, well, it's time for a change, you know, or God's leading us on or anything that would have been just a trite oversimplification 
we knew would have not helped them out at all. It would have potentially led to major division between us and our children. It would have caused them confusion in their faith. And so we made the decision to share with them every detail that we believed they could shoulder. And as high school boys and an adult woman, that was fairly all of it. We needed to explain it to them so that they would understand our heart before the Lord. We shared our own, you know, perspectives, actions, words. We shared the permit. We also wanted to give them permission to process it their own way. We didn't want to lead them into a position they had to take or force them to follow our footsteps, but we laid it all out in a way that would make it very clear for them. And we also wanted to model that this is a real Christian life. You know, it isn't always easy and that we do not follow human beings. We're not following people. We're not following a church. We're following Jesus. And this is the first time in our family's history that we're actually having to live that out. And so we we wanted it to not confuse their faith in him, not confuse their trust in us, not confuse their walk forward. And it didn't make it easier for them. It was still, I mean, it's hard to even put words to what the loss was for our children, what it continues to be at times. But they're all three, and I say this with just massive gratitude to the Lord, not to to say that it's any thing my husband and I can put a plaque on the wall for or anything, but all three of them are still pursuing the Lord um, and in great relationship with us. And still, you know, they're not, they're not so rattled by what we walked through that they don't know what's up and what's down. And that was really our prayer is that they could walk through this completely shaking experience and know that what can't be shaken remains. And I, I do believe that 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 worked out for them and they've thanked us for it. So that was our, our journey. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Oh my goodness. Yes. One, one primary conversation that happens with anyone who's going through this, who has kiddos is we have to communicate to whatever degree we can for their age because yes. they're noticing yes. stuff. And not just because yours were older at a young age, they're noticing that things are changing. They're noticing they're going somewhere new. Maybe the rules are different because beliefs are shifting. All kinds of stuff happen. They're not seeing the same people that they used to see. They maybe overhear bits of conversations or feel some tension or stress in the household. I mean, all of this, all of this, especially depending on the age, kiddos can internalize and start to make it like, you know, especially when they're younger, when it's like everything's about them, the world revolves around them. And so, well, did I do something or did I, you know, what's going on? And so we just add the clarity. If we just offer them that clarity again, in a reasonable amount, simple terms, especially again, age dependent, Right. it just frees them up of holding any of that themselves and knowing, okay, this isn't my fault. This isn't something I'm responsible for. And also, mom and dad have this, like we're still safe. We're okay. Mm -hmm. Like everything's going to be fine. They're navigating it. We're clued in to the degree to which, you know, again, it's appropriate. And I'm so glad. And I I know you say like, it's because of God and you're not going to put a plaque on your wall. I'm so (laughs) glad that you made choices to do it this way though, because there is, I think there is fruit to be seen from it. Now, people may still walk away like adult kiddos. They may still decide. I'm not talking about your your boys. I'm saying for anyone else where you're like, if anyone else is listening, they're like, gosh, I was more transparent. And now my kids are questioning God. You know, maybe they are identifying as atheists at this time or something like that. They have to go through that own processing, like you mentioned. And I'm glad you gave your boys and your daughter the opportunity to do that. If you guys have to make a decision, ask questions you know, consult with other people, whatever that has to look like. And just trusting that we still get to be there. We can still be an anchor for them. God Mm -hmm. still has their hand on their lives. And knowing, okay, this can come full circle. Like they need to kind of make sense of the ugly that our adult brains were grappling to make sense of. That was hard enough for us with fully developed brains. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and the other thing I just thought of, too, is that when, when we began, I mean, we took quite a while away from church altogether, and we needed to. We just were, we were just hemorrhaging. You know, that's the only, it's such a yucky graphic ex- way to describe it, but that's just how we felt. We were just gutted, and we took a while before we even decided we wanted to try to step foot in, in another church, and we did that as a, as a family where we went into different, you know, local churches to see how does this feel? Of course, my husband and I had a checklist of things we that were top on our priority list of like, this has to be here. This has to be here if we're going to go here. But we did that with them. So we were able to actually help them to identify what is actually important to look for in a church. It's not the quality of the worship band. <laughs> <laughs> my my boys are are musicians and so it is kind of funny we walked out of one one time and they were like man the bass was too loud on that and I was like well that is something that is not going to be on our litmus test for a safe church but you know I'm glad you identified that but anyway so we were able to walk the journey forward with them too not just the journey through what had happened in the past but even continuing to this day I try to be very transparent with my kids because I don't want them to set up false expectations about what it looks like to follow Jesus. It doesn't always look like roses and rainbows and butterflies and epic dreams coming true and, you know, mountaintop experiences. Like we were promised that this life would include the fellowship of his sufferings. And um, that is, I think, one of the sweetest fellowships that no one wants to be a part of. But I've wanted to walk transparently before them in my, in how I fail and how I navigate pain. So that, because like you said, our children are experts at detecting hypocrisy. They know when we're saying something, we don't really live. And I'd rather live out what it really looks like and have them choose based on that than me feeling like I need to make everything look prettier on the outside than it really is because that doesn't really help them. (laughs) No, and I think something, I mean, they're not here for me to ask. I'd love to ask them this, though. What they learned is okay for them to do. Like, I mean, just that modeling for them of, no, share what's going on, and you don't have to stay stuck, and it's okay to ask questions, and it's okay to have healthy boundaries for your safety and to have a, a requirement that a place be generally healthy. Let it not be toxic. Now we're not talking perfect, but healthy. You know, if we mess up, we say so and we seek reconciliation. I mean, all of these really good things. Yeah. Um, it's okay to feel what you feel. We don't sin in our feelings, but it's good to feel them. You mm-hmm. know, we're it's a reflection of God that we have them. And so all of these things, you know, that you're speaking to, that they got to see you and your husband do. It's just, it's I I have no doubt that it's could continue to be very powerful in their lives as they journey so. forward. Yeah. Speaking of your relationship with church, so not this church specifically, not the church where you experience the spiritual abuse, but just with church, kind of big C church, but also little C church, like a local community congregation that you're a part of. How is your relationship with church now? Yeah. Well, we are attending a church. We actually did join a church. So that's a quick answer to the local church question. Um, I would say my really, I'll start there with local church and then kind of zoom out to the, to the body of Christ, bigger church with the local church. We, we have found a church. It, we've actually been there about five years. So it seems like it's the same. There was a break in between it just that it's in that same five year time. We've been there going on five years and it, we feel that we're in a safe church. The leadership is very humble. It's elder led. It's got a lot of those, everything that we were looking for on our checklist, And we feel safe there and we serve there. And, but I will say that it, the, I think the piece that's been hardest for me and the part that is still in process and that I I don't have answers for is the role of the church for me emotionally and my relationship with it communally. So we have these analogies, you know, when you join a church, a lot of times we'll say our church family and we use words like family, and we use words that set up expectations for something that's deeply intimate emotionally. And because of what I've walked through, that is that is a piece that I am really 
trying to hold before the Lord because I still ache for those things. I had an an intimate relationship in a system or a church that I was a part of for 23 years. It held a, it was a family to me, whether or not it ended up having healthy members or toxic members or what, just like a normal family, you know, there's going to be people that are healthier than others, but it's still your family. And I had a role in it and I felt a place in it. And I had people I thought were mentors to me and like the, the, the women I would call out for when I was aching and just different roles that have not been replaced in my life. And that grieves me. So I, I sometimes, my husband and I talk about it a lot. Like, is this even a biblical desire? Uh, is this something that is still a place of need of healing in me that I ache for this or that? Uh, so we, it, it's kind of an ongoing journey. I've done biblical studies on what, you know, the role of the church, what, what is a biblical church supposed to be? Um, I'm not an expert on that. I wouldn't call myself a content expert on ecclesiology, but I have done some dives into that just to understand is what's the church, the local church supposed to be? Do we even need to be a part of a local church? Those kind of things. And we've, we feel pretty settled in, in that, yes, we do want to still be a part of a local church. But we sit on the out on the outside. We'll say even when we serve on the worship, my husband's on worship team some, and I've done a few things. It still feels like being on the outside looking in, and some of that is by choice because we're just uncertain of how much we even want to plug in again after you give that many years of your life to a family you think is that really loves you, and you come to find out that. They actually really didn't. That's a broad statement. I'm sure there are individuals who really still do love us, but to be dismissed and discarded like that from a community makes it very difficult to re-engage in an intimate way, although I still long for it. So um, the bigger picture on the church, when I look out at what's going on in the big church, there are things that I'm praising God for, such as I know this sounds crazy, but the the attention that's being drawn to some of these abuses and some of these areas of complacency or compromise that has brought us to this point in history in the church, they're being exposed. And it, it is uncomfortable for, for all of us at times, but it's so necessary. I feel like light is exposing disease um, in many places. But at the same time, I feel grieved how many people go through experiences like I have or like you have and are left basically just to figure out their own pain for themselves, to find their own healing, to discover what went wrong, to put language to their own, you know, basically we're left to diagnose our own injury and do our own surgery And, you know, all of those things. And that grieves me. I know I'm not the only one that experienced, has experienced this, that the church is not doing a great job of of ministering in general. Again, I'm sure there are wonderful churches here and there that are doing that. But in general, what I see, especially in my local area, is that the church is not doing a great job of ministering to its broken or its wounded, especially when they have been gutted by other pastors. It's almost like pastors have lost, or I don't know, I'm still searching this one out, but I get discouraged at what seems to be a a very um, hesitant approach to calling out wolves, to warning other sheep about, hey, that's a wolf. Like there's a, there's a hesitance, a fear even, to actually help the flock avoid harmful places and harmful people. And I get discouraged by that because it, then it leaves it to housewives and, and you know, our women and people that have gone through the wounded end up crying out, hey, watch out for that guy. Don't go over there. And then that makes the wounded people look like they're trying to cause division or be gossips or it's putting the wounded in the place of trying to save other wounded. And I get I hope I'm not just rambling here. I hope that's making any sense. It's just sad to me. It's like, where are the leaders in the body of Christ who are willing to be like Paul was when he named names and said, avoid that person? Or when Jesus came out in public and reprimanded the abusers of the, you know, those 
Pharisees who, you know, the sin of the Pharisees wasn't that what they were teaching was wrong. It was that they weren't doing what they were teaching and it was causing people to lose their faith. And, you know, where are these champions uh, in the body of Christ? That's kind of one of the things that grieves me uh, looking out. And I guess I got a little impassioned there. So <laughs> um, that is, it's an ongoing dive into the scripture for me, an ongoing journey of extending grace and trying to humbly understand. But when you walk through it, you see it through a different lens. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, I can get equally impassioned about these topics. So you're in good company. You're completely yeah. fine. Go ahead and say what needs to be said. Yeah, it's really tough to look out there and see. I mean, we were having a conversation yesterday about, yeah, people not sharing what's going on and how do we help and what are our options here and let's let's warn people and let's equip people and let's stop acting like the people who are crying spiritual abuse are really just upset because they don't like what scripture says. That is right. not our majority, you guys. It's not our majority. Now, we're not saying it doesn't happen. Right. But I like giving the example of at Be Emboldened, we have had hundreds of people over the past few years and not a single one fell into that category. And believe me, I have basically no tolerance for it. So yeah. I don't know why it just hasn't happened. I'm like, no, like if someone yeah. is just doesn't like what scripture says, now I'll take a look at the approach. Like did someone, you know, with the approach horrific because we certainly have an issue there still. But if it's no, if it's a loving kind approach and it was accurate, then it's just, this is what it says, you know, like this is the truth and that's something for you to wrestle through with. And I'm happy to pray with you or happy to, you know, do a deep dive into it or what, but this is mm -hmm. still what it says. And you then decide what to do with that. If you believe right. it's God's word, if you're going to be convicted and come into alignment with it, you know, that's then your journey. Happy to still be a part of it, but yeah. I'm not going to wiggle on what the word of God says. Right. And no one has fallen into that category. And yet this is what we hear so much of. It's just minimizing the damage that has been done. And I think my husband just brought up to me, he was listening to a new book that um, is out. Uh, he was listening to it on Audible, I believe. And he said, is it 27%? You guys don't quote me on this. Um, if I can find it, I'll add it to the show notes. But something like 27-ish percent of young adults who have left the church are reporting that who have deconstructed in the like deconstructed in the you know historical sense of no longer Christian and are now identifying as atheist or something else. And I think it's 27% ish who have said that's because of spiritual abuse. Yeah. That's I mean, I don't you, doubt it. I don't doubt it. Um, and yeah. And I wonder of those people, how many would have loved to have found someone like, you know, or a ministry like Be Emboldened where they would, I mean, actually, no matter how long, no matter how long the road, just compassionately listen, help them understand what they walked through and make sure, you know, help take the time to actually walk them down the road of identifying what the Bible actually teaches, because what, you know, a lot of times it's a counterfeit Jesus involved as well, or, or, you know, misapplication of scripture, the twisting of scripture that led to the situation they're in and, and being able to find solid biblical churches or solid biblical ministries, like be emboldened to walk passionately or patiently and compassionately alongside people, leading them to biblical truth and helping them to be able to have the tools to discern it on their own for the first time so that they can be free to make a decision that isn't manipulated. And I, I really love that the emboldened is doing that. And that's what I wish I saw more of happening in the broader church as well. Just that understanding that a lot of these people, it's not that they want to become cynical of the body of Christ, but there are a lot of open arms out there right now for people who are, who are wounded in the church. There's a lot of open arms but not all of them want to lead you back to the, to the biblical worldview, which in my own journey, after asking my most difficult questions and, and putting Jesus and the Bible under my most difficult scrutiny, still remains the most beautiful picture of hope and healing that a broken person can find. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> 
Well, you have also been doing it over the past five years. And you were one of the first people I found when we were initially founding this organization. And you let me, a complete stranger, which you probably shouldn't do on a regular basis, but you let me into your home, (laughs) actually. And we recorded for an hour. And then my son came in and decided to open all our cabinets and run into, you know, every door in her home, which she had never done before. And she handled that so graciously. So cute. And from there, you know, you joined our board of directors, which has been such a gift to this organization because we care about accountability. We care about people being on the board who will actually make sure that, you know, I don't go rogue someday. Nobody else does and make sure that I'm removed if anyone's going to get harmed. So a real board of directors who really does hold people accountable and check things. And now you are also our newest mentor on the Be Emboldened team. So Mm -hmm. you will, in an official sense with BE, be walking alongside people who have similarly suffered to you. So I say all of that right back to you. I am in some of the most beautiful company. And I know I know so personally what it feels like to have these different gaps mm-hmm. in our relationships after we have experienced something like you and I have experienced those, those abuses that impact all of our relationships, mm-hmm. our worldview, all of our relationships, all these aspects of just of our day-to-day. And we leave and we're like, gosh, I don't have that person anymore. And I don't have that person. I have these gaps now. I have these Mm -hmm. holes in my life. And God, will they ever be filled? And through this journey with Be Emboldened, you have been someone who has filled one for me. And Mm -hmm. so I'm so grateful to you for that. And so I share it with you you right now to tell you it does happen over time. And it's such a blessing when it does. And I think it's beautiful. I think the desire that we have for those roles is such so beautiful. I do think that they are they're God's design in us. And I recognize mm-hmm. they may not get them all filled. It may not happen again. You know, did I ever yeah. really have them filled before? That's a whole question too. Yeah. Of course, I won't get that <laughs> philosophical. But, but no, I may not have them all filled. And I'm so grateful. It turns me back towards God, you know, and knowing that He really is, is my everything that I need. And yeah. he shows up for me in the ways that I really need to be shown up for. But it's such a kindness when he does start to fill in these other pieces with beautiful people. Yeah. And so I, I hope that that's encouraging to share that, gosh, it can take a really long time. Yeah. But I'm glad. I'm glad for the perseverance because it's just that much sweeter when it comes. So mm-hmm. I'm going to transition on to the next question. I want to ask, you've already spoken to how you've held on to your faith. You know who Christ is. You know who your Lord is. How is there anything else you'd want to add in how the spiritual abuse experiences has influenced your relationship with God? Well, I think what it has caused me to do is to substantiate my beliefs, to to really take a good look at why I believe what I believe. Um, I knew that I had a very strong um, subjective relationship with Jesus and and belief in the truthfulness of his ministry his his life death burial and resurrection and what I what I mean by that is that I had my personal testimony I had the the encounter that I had with his love and also many years of studying God's word and and I don't want to say that I didn't have any intellectual investment into my faith before the spiritual abuse but around that season was when I was beginning to actually put my beliefs to the test on my own. And after the spiritual abuse, it it really put me into a place of leaning into the gospel and who Jesus was at the core, like just the simple, basic reason why I would still want to follow Jesus. Because as you mentioned, I, I even know friends, personal people that walked through the same church, the same leader, the same situation, who now are no longer wanting anything to do with the church or religion or Jesus. And so, you know, I I really wanted to understand my own choice to continue to follow him. And so it has been very fruitful because I have done more intentional study of different doctrines that I believe um, untangling scriptures that were misapplied, that were twisted to keep me in a feeling of 
um, confusion, helping to untangle some of that. This is an ongoing journey, by the way. I never want to sound like, oh, I'm done now and everything's perfect because it isn't. It's always ongoing. Um, but I've learned to have a lifestyle of where I'm, I am willing to trust Jesus enough to um, give him the benefit of the doubt while I dig into the very troubling issues that I do have sometimes. There are things about the Bible. There are things about the Christian life that are that can be troubling or like, what? Really? This is what the Bible says. This is what I'm, you know, how I'm supposed to do that we can have that. It actually sometimes even feels offensive to our own nature that I've been like, you know what? I'm just going to go there. I'm just going to go ahead and dig in. And I have to this day never walked away thinking I had any substantive reason to walk away from my faith in Jesus and who he is and even scripture, because that is one of the things like I know the Bible itself can be very triggering. Uh, especially when it's been used as a weapon. I know the scripture itself can be very um, traumatizing at times to those who've had it beaten over their heads and twisted to can, to victimize them over and over and over again. But we know in our heads that this that the Bible is supposed to be God's word. You know, this is supposed to be an authoritative text of some sort. And my journey of trying to figure out, well, why, why can't, why should I trust this book? I mean, I was told it's this, you know, when I was a kid, people had a lot of respect for it. Even if you weren't a Christian, you know, you'd bring a Bible out and people would stop cussing, you know, things like there was more respect for the Bible, even culturally when I was a child. Nowadays, there's no cultural respect for the Bible. So I decided to do my own investigating on that because if this book is going to be my, my, my manual of life. I want to make sure, first of all, is it, has it been transmitted over time faithfully? So I had to do a, a study of like, how was the Bible transmitted? Is it like the telephone game or was it something a little bit more substantive than that? And then also not only how was it transmitted, but does it tell the truth? And why should I believe it's God's word? What does that even mean? Why does it mean that it's inspired by God? What doesn't it mean? And of course, this takes time. This is not something you can get in a five minute you know, TED talk. This is this is a journey of of for me being willing to grapple with what I consider the most important issues of life. And that is why am I here? What happens when I die? What do I do with all my pain? All these broken pieces, Lord. I've got all these broken pieces. I've been abused in my childhood, a first marriage that was massively abusive, now this, all these broken pieces. What am I going to do with these? Um, are they even real? I mean, that is one of the things we're up against right now, too, in our culture that's so mind boggling to me because everyone says, you know, live your truth. But for a survivor of abuse, that's one of the most damaging things we could buy into. How beautiful would it be for an abuser of any kind to get us to believe our own truth, that it's only our truth. That's what they want to say is it's just in your own head. No, that's not what we're saying. We're actually, we want truth that's objectively substantiated outside of our heads, what's true about reality. And that is, you know, I guess I'm, I could go on and on because I just, my journey walking through the abuses I've been through in my life, I want truth. I want the truth. I want to know what is the truth. How do I navigate my real pain? Not just pain that's between my own ears, but what really happened to me? What is really going to happen to me when I die? Who is there really a God? And that journey has been so fruitful and it has been bolstered by what I went through because I was basically left on my own in some ways. I wasn't getting fed what someone else believed about God. This is me now going on a journey of my own, trying to put language to what I went through, trying to find the most complete, beautiful box top to look to, to know what to do with all the pieces of my life and the biblical box top, the worldview that I see, you know, when you read scripture faithfully and, um, you know, the way it's, you know, as close to the way we can, as it's meant to be read, it does present a beautiful picture. So, um, that was a lot, but, uh, I'm thankful for that, for that inspiration to do a deeper dive I don't want to give up. I'm not ready to just throw in the towel. You know, I'm not ready to just say, well, my life's a big shambles of broken pieces and just stare at it, stare at the pile. Um, some days it's tempting. 
Some days I do want to just look at the pile and sit there and cry and go, why me, Lord? Why so much abuse in my life? Why? But then I think about that beautiful fellowship of Christ's sufferings. And I think there must be something to this. And I don't want to stop searching until I've, until I've tasted the, the, the beauty, not just the bitterness, but the sweetness of being a part of that fellowship. Hmm. One thing I want to go back and highlight is what you said about the people living their truth thing and how culturally that's kind of where it's at. And, you know, people may may put whatever out on social media and make it look all pretty and polished. And maybe they say certain things with their friends, but really what's going on internally and something that, you know, we hear when we're in these these kinds of roles where we walk, walk alongside people inside really like what their truth is is that abuse was their fault yeah and that they're worthless Mm -hmm. and that it's meaningless and there's no purpose and that they're dirty they're tainted beyond repair Mm -hmm. yeah these are the kinds of quote-unquote truths right people are walking around believing that's why suicide rates you know for kiddos is through the roof that's why i mean living our truth this is what living the truth can our version of truth can look like especially when we're people who have been abused when we have suffered from childhood or as adults yeah. through these experiences particularly in spiritual abuse where it's been done by a leader that we looked up to mm-hmm. and we believe that they were speaking what god has said that they're relaying right. what god has said and so well then it must be true right And that's where the Bible is so powerful and so helpful to us because the Bible actually debunks all of that. Right. That is not what is actually true. That is not what is actually said about us. And yet we've been told that it is, and that is not the true story. It's far from the whole story. This is not what Jesus came and died for. It was not because we are worthless to him. That doesn't make any sense. Right. And so thank you so much for bringing attention to that. And so again, anybody out there who is listening or watching and is like, gosh, that's how I feel inside. And I haven't had a safe place to say it. And I don't know if I can believe these good things. You know, it takes time for us to actually believe the good things, even though we can look at it in black and white or in red, you know, depending on the print in our Bible, we can have people remind us, but our, we can change. Like we can learn these things. Our brains have these patterns to them and those patterns can change over time. It's proven. And that's something that I think is a gift and how God designed us. So, yeah. and yes, we we love to remind people of what is actually true while not compromising, of course, on anything there that is also difficult. So TC, as you are reflecting on this journey of moving forward over the past five years, for those who are listening, those who are watching to this conversation, what has helped you? Like, what suggestions would you maybe have for others that you have found to be helpful? Yeah, what has helped me the most is at the beginning, right when I first, you know, came out of and it was in my deepest, most just um, raw place was kind of really taking actions to guard my heart, which included eliminating voices from my life that were confusing me even more. So that would be like I um, either unfriended or hid certain people on social media or kind of hold away from relationships that I wasn't trying to say, I don't like you anymore. I don't want to ever be your friend, but this is massively confusing to me. And so kind of take getting my life really small, giving myself permission to just clear my plate a little bit and and have time. And then I began to really intentionally go try to find words to describe what I had just walked through. So I um, I think one of the very first videos I ever found, and I, I don't think it's a, I, I know you appreciate this woman's work as well, Dr. Diane Langberg. She is just an amazing God, just Holy Spirit filled, oozes the love of Christ, um, professional in the field of uh, working with victims of multiple types of trauma and abuse, including like heinous trauma from what what people are experiencing worldwide and, and horrible evils. But she has a video out there. I think it's called Narcissism and the Systems It Creates. And she's got blogs and articles. And I just started on one and, and it was like, oh my gosh, it was just, that's that's what I went through. And 
thing, you know, beginning to read some books that people would recommend. Um, there were just a handful of people that I trusted enough to listen to their recommendations because they had walked through it already. And I began to read for myself, read for myself, defining what I went through was massively, that was like a huge catapult into my healing, being able to put words to it, to understand, to begin to slowly understand that I was not crazy, that we were not crazy. What we saw, we actually saw what we felt, we really felt and it began to put words to it. And then to continue that journey, like I said, to just, sometimes it was just a five minute blog or podcast that I had the energy or the heart to even listen to, but to just stay intentional and not disengaging from my faith or my questions that I had about Jesus. Also, I found a, like a small community of friends. Some of them we had known for years. Some had come out of our former church or um, the community, and we had common experience that that bound our hearts together. And oftentimes we would just share our stories and sometimes we would repeat them over and over again, which um, was so healing because each time we would share to a compassionate group that cared and, and understood there was a deeper level of healing and there was no shame involved. I think that was a part of the freedom for me was realizing I'm not doing anything wrong by sharing my story. I'm not doing anything wrong here where I'd come out of a culture that would have really, you know, made me feel that I was doing something evil or immoral to, to talk about my journey, that it was gossip or divisive or something like that. So having that small, safe group was just so, so meaningful. I remember when I had been at my former church and other people had been the ones that were gone, I would see maybe pictures online of them having gatherings with each other. And I would just, I mean, it's awful to say, but I would think in my mind, oh, wow, that's just a group of disgruntled, bitter people, you know, getting together to talk bad about my pastor or this church. And now, I mean, it's unfortunate that we sometimes learn through going through it ourselves. But now I realize, no, it's a group of very broken people finding compassion in one another and and being there for one another when no one else is. So I'm, I'm glad that I got to experience that. It gives me so much more empathy and um, gratitude for the you know, for people who have compassion for the broken. Yeah, it's not gossip and it's not slander to share right. our stories, to seek healing, to seek guidance, to seek counsel, to seek support as we're hurting, and to warn others. Sometimes people get hung up on that of, well, that's right. slander, that's gossip. Well, it could be. What's your intention and who are you sharing with? And does that make sense with your intention? You know, if my intention is one right. thing, but I'm sharing with this group of people that are not wise counsel and are not supportive and are not going to, you know, it's like, okay, well, maybe maybe there's something else going on here. Or if my intention is to yeah. slander and to, then, okay, not the same thing. But when we're doing what you did and what we encourage people to do through BE, yeah, that's that's a good thing. That's something people can get silenced because of that. And I've heard it in people's stories mm -hmm. where, yeah. oh, well, we can't share what happened to us because that would be gossip or that would be slander. It's like, you can't even get help. You're totally blocked. You're totally blocked. You can't right. get help. So yeah, thank you for speaking right. to that. Yeah, isolation is is definitely, I know there's a time when we want to hole away and be, we need to, and it's just like, oh my gosh, you're just sitting there kind of needing to just be alone and figure a few things out. But I, I, I would encourage people to just get out of isolation as soon as they feel safe to with one person at a time and, and not to feel that you need to jump whole hog back into another church community by any means, but to try to find people that will faithfully lead you in the direction your heart genuinely wants to go. And um, that, that was just so, so meaningful, such a gift for me. And what ways would you like to continue to heal and rebuild? And what ways are you not where you hope to be yet? <sighs> well, I will be honest that there are times when I still battle um, just confusion over, I guess, what just, I guess not my purpose, because I know my my primary purpose 
and I'm not I'm not at all worried about my calling or anything like that. But it is it is kind of massively confusing to walk through 23 years of life and come out on the other side having to start over and figure so many things out. And I would I would love to just continue to grow in my ability to just have peace in the moment. I I mean just I I look back and I wonder a lot of times where it's not just that I'm grieving what 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 I thought I had that's gone, but I also grieve what might have been if I had spent 23 years of my life in a healthy culture that was actually a trampoline rather than a ceiling. And I have I want to just be able to hold all of that with I guess I just need to continue to to walk the stages of grief with that. I mean, it's never going to go away. We know grief isn't something that goes away. We just, we can have healthier and healthier grief. So I want to get healthier in what I'm grieving, what, what could have been, what, what isn't the ripple effects still happen in my life of things. Um, There are weddings I'm not invited to. There are narratives that are spun about me. There are, jobs I haven't been able to get. And, you know, so there's these things that are still a cost that I grieve. And I also would like to just have more confidence. I I know that sounds crazy, but I, my, it's not that I lack confidence in my ability to, to come to decisions about Jesus or, or like the Bible, but I lack confidence in my own, um, abilities sometimes just if that even makes any sense i just sometimes feel paralyzed on what to say or what to do next and that doesn't happen every day it's 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 getting better and better but i i would like to just not be feel that that wall that i just sometimes still hit and i think that's as a result of having lived so many years of my life in a certain culture. And then here I am now five years is, is a good amount of time, but it's really not that long. Um, so I just want desire to continue to understand. I want to continue to trust God with my own heart to help me identify patterns that are unhealthy so that I can continue to be set free and those places where I'm still broken to continue to surrender those pieces to him so that I can find more healing in, in my um, view of, of the rest of my, because I'm only, I'm 55. That's old, but it isn't so old. You know, like I have, I have time left, but I don't want to waste time. And so I'm just praying, God, please mm-hmm. just help me break through these places of paralysis and these places of uncertainty in, in my own Christ, my identity is in him, but like in my abilities to be a vessel of his love and my ability and skill set to be able to be used by him in his kingdom, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it, it segues into the next question, which in some ways you've answered, but maybe more directly, you'll be able to give us a more direct answer to it. How have you found purpose through your suffering? I think the greatest purpose that I have found is my ability to empathize with the hurting and the, um, the ability to bring the comfort that I am receiving and hand it over, you know, to, and to give that same comfort to others who are broken, uh, to see the hurting in a new light. And, um, yeah, I mean, I guess that would be the, the biggest thing is just my eyes are now open. I see the broken. I see the hurting. And I have a desire to do all I can to be a safe place for them. I'm not going to be perfect. I'm still learning. And it's like I see myself as just maybe, a, you know, a, a friend who's read a few more books or walked a few more miles. I'm still on the journey. But whatever I have tasted and seen that actually has brought help, that is true, that has, then has helped my journey, I want to share it. <laughs> I just want to share it. Here, try this. This works. This is good, you know. Uh, so that is something that has, that has definitely been a fruit out of what I've walked through and a purpose. Any final thoughts you'd like to share as you reflect on these past five years? 
My final thoughts, I think I've kind of made them throughout, but my final thought would be to just encourage the broken, those who have walked through a similar journey, to really intentionally pursue the the box top. This is the analogy I heard. It's not original to me, but you know, with those broken pieces of our life, we admit that they're broken. It's okay. We're we've got these broken pieces. And the world has offered many, many box tops. And like we get a puzzle, we want to, we we don't know how to put it together without a box top. We look to that box top to see what do I do with these pieces. And it's the same with what I feel like with my broken pieces. I've got all these broken pieces and I'm trying to figure out how to put them into some kind of a story that can make sense because we all long for that. Like you said, I think earlier, we're longing for meaning. We, we're longing for solid ground to stand on. Nobody is searching for um, to be floating in an endless sea of doubt. Nobody wants that. We all want certainty of some sort. And so we're looking for what to do with these puzzle pieces. And And I just... I want to encourage everyone to go on an intentional search for which box top actually makes the most sense and provides the most beautiful picture of what to do with those pieces. For me, as I've been very honest about, it is the biblical the biblical worldview, what the Bible says about our brokenness the, and, and what God's plan is for it and his, and, and his solution and his, his healing and his love. One of the quotes I've heard, though, that I will say, honestly, uh, Greg Kokel says this, um, he says, you know, all worldviews, or I, I'm going to blow this here. My paraphrase is that that there isn't a box top out there, so to speak, that isn't going to have loose ends or missing parts. There's not one that we're going to look at and it's going to s- satisfy us in every possible way. We're going to walk away going perfect. So every worldview has loose ends. Every every ideology is going to leave us with something that dissatisfies us or has bla- holes, blank spots. So what we want to do is find the one that has the most filled in pieces, the least loose ends. And the way Greg Kokel says it is that even with its loose ends, the the biblical meta narrative, the Bible's story offers us such a beautiful story of the way the world really is. And it gives us something solid to stand on, hope to really have that that is bigger than our own story, that is um, that is eternal and outside of of time. And I just encourage you, everyone who's watching to go on that journey and to be honest and to be intentional and to, um, find someone like be emboldened that can walk alongside you as a trusted mentor and guide when you have questions, but it's a journey that's worth going on. I, I'm still on it and intend to stay on it the rest of my days. And, um, it isn't easy. It's that my, I'm not perfected. I'm not totally healed. One of the things I, I still don't see a lot of is justice. Um, and I know I might not see a lot of that this side of heaven, but the things that I do see, the redemption I have seen is so precious and so good. I see it in the smiles of my grandbabies. Um, I see it in the new friendships I have. And again, I see it in those opportunities I have to come alongside other broken people uh, to help them see they're not alone. So, um, that would be my final word, I guess. (laughs) Maybe that's too much or not enough. I don't know, but that's what I would say. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for not only letting me have this conversation with you, because it's truly an honor and a privilege to be able to be the one to sit down and have this conversation with you, but thank you for your boldness and your courage and being loud about what you've experienced and what you're seeing. I personally know the vulnerability required for us to be transparent. I know the further losses we can take from being transparent. And I pray that you know it has served me directly and it has served so many others. And so we're I'm absolutely cheering you on. And I'm so thankful to be a co-laborer with you. And that is one of the gaps you have filled for me. So my sincere appreciation. Thank you. I, I feel the same. 